and welcome to this week's episode of the Main Challenge. Starting in the new year, this new year, once a month we are going to bring you What's Up Under the Dome, where we talk to people about what's happening in the legislature, not necessarily the news headlines, what's happening behind the scenes, the good things we may have missed, the things that are working. And so this week we start out with a smattering of what's going to be coming up, some of the big issues that are going to be coming up this session. We talked to Hannah Pingree from the Office of Innovation Policy in the Future, and we're going to talk with Molly on Dana about tribal sovereignty and the Indian Land Claims Settlement Act. And we're going to talk with Representative Charlotte Warren, Chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, about the intersection of criminal justice reform, mental health, and substance use disorder. We will come, as I said, once a month, and this week we're in for a really special treat. So please, have a look. I am so excited to have with us today uh, my friend Hannah Pingree, who is the director for the Office of Policy Innovation and the Future. No pressure. Um, so she is the woman who is helping us guide us into our future. Hi, Hannah, and welcome to the main challenge. Thank you ha for having me, Betsy. Great to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you too. So, Hannah, first I want to start with um, you know a lot of our viewers are really concerned about climate. A lot of young people are really engaged around the issue of climate change, and I know that your office and you have directed the Climate Council, and last year had some incredible wins. So let's just talk for a minute about what the wins that happened. You want to talk about a few of those? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the, the good news is, is that uh, Maine governor bills, the Maine legislature are taking the issue of climate very seriously. Um, and we have in a variety of ways engaged on every topic to figure out how we can reduce our emissions to do what we need to do for the whole planet, um, figure out how to prepare Maine's economy and figure out how to help those who are most vulnerable who are going to be impacted by climate. So um, about a year ago, um, we advanced Maine Won't Wait, which is a four-year plan for climate action. It received unanimous support from uh, the Climate Council, and now uh, we're doing all the things we need to do. We don't want it to be uh, just a plan that sits on a shelf. We are trying to take action in every area. Um, and last legislative session was a huge one. Yeah. Um, funding climate action, um, passing regulations, whether it was to reduce super pollutants, prepare for sea level rise, um, lots of budget actions to help us pay for climate. So I think there is a ton of good news and we're now in the phase of implementing, really getting people to understand what they can do, what kind of programs the state has available um, and, and take all the important steps we need to do in the next couple of years. Yeah, which is amazing. And I, I just um, read that in Newsweek, you know, Maine was cited for our ambitious goals um, in terms of climate for 2030 and 2050. And so, you know, I mean, that I think it really is is such a testament to you and the governor and the legislature. So talk a little bit about the, the double win, Hannah, on um, climate and then jobs, you know, in terms of what, you know, we're seeing some in-migration now of people into Maine. And I think that the climate stuff and the, the eco economic impacts of climate change are part of what's bringing people in. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I would say that climate is an overwhelming issue and it's, you know, for many of us, it's kind of depressing and overwhelming, but at the same time for a state like Maine that relies on our natural resources that has a lot of opportunity when it comes to climate, we see huge economic wins for the state while we take action on climate. Obviously, a state like Maine, we can produce renewable energy and produce renewable energy jobs. As we weatherize our homes, make our businesses more efficient, that's thousands of good paying jobs. Um, whether it's transitioning our fishing industry to be more diverse or really investing in forest products, things like wood fiber insulation, a manufacturing plant in Madison just now starting up to help make a highly efficient wood fiber insulation that's great for the climate and also great for rural jobs. So we see a ton of wins. Um, again, you mentioned Land for Maine's Future preserving our farmland, our working waterfront, our working forest lands. You know, that's good for our climate. It's good for the all the carbon we need to sequester in our soils, in our trees. And it's really good for Maine tourism and good for enjoying the outdoors. So, you know, Maine is not a state where we extract fossil fuels out of the ground. We export about $4 billion a year out of the state of Maine as we buy fossil fuels. So, if instead we can generate clean electricity in Maine, we create thousands of jobs, we manage uh, uh, and we take responsibility for climate um, and it really can be a win-win. Again, you know, climate's not all good news, but there's a lot of good news in Maine. Um, and for that reason, the governor set a goal to double the number of clean energy jobs in Maine by 2030. We have about 15,000 now. So that's, 
thousands of jobs that we hope young people will consider taking advantage of. People are moving to Maine for these jobs. Um, and I think it really sets Maine on, on a path um, to sustainability, which is important. Um, I know there's some legislative initiatives, but what about, what are you thinking about? I mean, I, I honestly, I will say the legislature has done enormous heavy lifting on climate policy, getting it into law and regulation over the last couple of years. Um, so the, the lifting this session, I would say, is not as heavy. We have um, a couple of things coming back to the legislature. We're, we're reporting back from the DEP on how we manage sea level rise um, mm -hmm. in a regulatory way, which is, which is obviously a you know, pretty serious issue. We are anticipating rising sea levels. So how do we do deal with that across our varying regulations is important. Um, we're continuing to figure out how we support municipalities. And we have a couple of different um, initiatives coming forward um, around supporting municipalities. We launched a new community resilience program to help towns prepare for climate. So that will be an ongoing discussion in the legislature. Um, Representative Lydia Bloom has something to help us continue to advance that um, in statute. Um, I, I will say, obviously, the budget is always the big area of discussion. We're looking at some surplus funds, and I think the governor is concerned about Maine people. We've seen a huge increase in natural gas prices, yeah. um, as well as other fuel prices. So that just continues to make the case that we need to help Maine people make their homes more efficient so we can you know, use less electricity, burn less fossil fuels. And so you'll see ongoing efforts to, to, to make that kind of long-term investment in our future. Okay, great. That both saves people money, uh, but also, um, you know, obviously helps transition us away from the reliance on these big fossil fuel industries, which we don't have control over. Yeah, which is amazing. So, yeah. um, and I know that uh, Representative Grahowski has a thing on packaging and like to have people, which is first in the nation, I think would be having manufacturers pay for the packaging, recycling and, and redoing costs up front. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, yeah. that seems to be, there's some exciting, there's some very and I will And I will say, I mean, our website, uh, main.gov slash future, we have a rundown of last legislative session and the funding initiatives that came through the budget, through the federal main jobs and recovery program. Um, all of the bills passed by the legislature from divesting our pension fund from fossil fuels to right. the lots of other environmental wins. I mean, I think it's, you know, we sort of have a bit of a embarrassment of riches. We have taken so much climate action that we are now digging in as an administration to make sure we get these programs right. So the regulations and rulemakings and, you know, how do we wisely spend the money and make sure everybody in Maine knows about it and the programs are well designed. I mean, we're, we're really focused on getting the job done because I think the legislature did a lot of the heavy lifting over the last couple of years. That's awesome. So it's really uh, implementation phase and making sure that, and as you said, so many of the good things, I mean, this year was dominated by COVID. I mean, and, and the yeah. fact that all this got done during COVID is pretty extraordinary. Um, yeah. And but I think that because of that, so many things went unnoticed. People don't know that there's help out there for weatherizing their homes or buying a heat pump or, or you know, um, any of that. So I think um, that's a really important piece. And I think that's a piece of the job that we don't see much, but is a, a really critical piece. And I'll just make a little plug. We actually launched a new website on December 1 called mainwontwait.org. Oh, wow. And it is really meant to be sort of a, a, a community and consumer facing website about how you can take climate action. It has specific actions for, for families and homeowners, for businesses and for communities. And so we're really trying to make sure people understand now what opportunities we have, what you can do in your own home or in your own community. Um, because again, we, ha we have a lot of exciting funds and programs that can help people make a difference. That is awesome. So it's a great way to wrap up to say, Maine won't wait. We can't wait. Um, I'm sure you've watched the movie, Don't Look Up. <laughs> but we are, all, we are all feeling that intense pressure, but also Maine is a bright light and um, in large part due to your efforts and the efforts of the governor and the environmental community that, and the legislature that has worked so hard to make us make sure that we don't wait. So thank you so much. We will be there all watching and helping and even the, the part that's not so sexy, which is the implementation part, but that's the part that's gonna make it work. So thank you so much for your work and thanks for being with us. Thank you, Betsy, great to see you. All right, you too, take care. I am so happy to welcome again to our program, uh, Ambassador, Tribal Ambassador for the Penobscot Nation, Molly Dana, who is um, just an incredible advocate and uh, just a beautiful presence in the legislature all the time. And so Molly it's great to see you again and thanks for joining us here on Main Challenge. Great to see you, Betsy. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. So 
let's just pick up where we left off last year. So LD1626, it looked to me like it was on a pretty good trajectory and then it, st it got stalled and it's got held over so it's going to come back in the session. So tell us a little bit about where it stands and, you know, just what the situation is right now. Sure. So 1626, um, the bill to amend the implementing and, and the settlement acts. So we had um, a public hearing with, with limited kind of verbal testimony, but we actually got all kinds of um, support in written testimony uh, that I think will be really important going forward. And we we're super thankful for that. So where we're at right now, since it was carried over, we will be seeing it again in the Judiciary Committee. And, you know, we've spent this time in between working with that coalition of supporters, um, working with lawmakers and, and negotiating with the governor's office and, and really trying to address all of those, you know, many concerns and gray areas in, in the large bill before, um, you know, so that we can go into this session, you know, crossing those T's and, and dotting those I's. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're coming back with the same bill, um, the, the large omnibus bill to, to address the Settlement Act. And, and we'll see, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll have all that great support again and, and we can really see this thing through. Yeah, awesome. So will there be another public hearing, do you think, or is that sort of, that part's over? It's just the work session stuff now. I believe there will be another public hearing. I think as far as tribal leaders, it was just me that testified in that one. So now we'll really bring together all the chiefs and, and those that sat on the task force and, and get a fuller picture of the tribal perspective, which I'm really glad for. Can you talk a little bit about what the challenges have been and the pushbacks have been? Absolutely. So you're very right. Uh, the bill looks complicated. It's the result of that task force process. Um, you know, the, the tribal leaders and the lawmakers and the governor's office and AG's office, you know, they all came to together and produce these 22 recommendations to amend the Settlement Act, which really has been the backdrop and the foundation of this chaotic, distrustful, um, tense relationship with the tribes in the state it is the interpretation of this act. And, you know, something about the Settlement Act that I don't think a lot of people realize is there was language inserted that prevented the tribes in Maine from having access to federal legislation uh, to benefit tribes. So that's been a hardship for our tribes. And, and that's really kind of the basis for the 1626 is getting back to using federal Indian law as a backstop and getting us back to those rights that we never ceded when we agreed to the 1980 settlement. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that the pushback you know, some say this is too big. There's too many changes. Um, you know, the state will be losing control uh, over the tribes. And, and that's kind of what we want. Isn't that the point? Right. Yeah. In other states, um, you know, tribes are able to really benefit from that relationship with the federal government, which is by no means perfect. But it is what we are supposed to have as federally recognized tribal nations. So to have this document uh, that our tribal leaders were told back then could be changed and amended over time if it wasn't working to have that, you know, it's been such an ironclad oppressive thing for 40 years. Of course, we would like to see life beyond it. And, and I think the tribes are really interested in a lot of good healing uh, mm -hmm. in this relationship. And that really can't happen unless we address this act. So, you know, I think there's been efforts to change things in state statute and try to make this more of a piecemeal uh, effort. But the tribal leaders have really stayed strong in, you know, the only way to reach meaningful gains and having our sovereignty restored and recognized is addressing the Settlement Act. And the best way to do that is through 1626. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So, so it, um, Talk for a minute about, so the only thing that I've heard, well, I shouldn't say the only thing, there's a whole issue around gaming, right? And there, there's some people who are really worried, and I don't know, I mean, I don't understand why, but has that come up at all in this, in this context? So the task force did recommend that the tribes essentially be able to operate gaming under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. So that's a federal law the tribes haven't had access to because of the Settlement Act. And what people don't understand about IGRA is that it's actually a restrictive act. It's not like here you have the right to do gaming you know, from the federal government. It's actually, you know, tribes had these these rights on to do class three gaming and there were conflicts with state governments. So uh, this federal law was passed 
to allow for states and tribes to negotiate these compacts. Mm. So the recommendation out of the task force was let's, you know, give authorization to the tribes under IGRA to negotiate with the state, um, you know, everything in regards to gaming. And we ran that bill. uh, We took it out of the larger bill. Yeah. And we ran it last year, uh, LD 554, sponsored by Rep Ben Collings. And we got it through the committee, House and Senate, and it was vetoed by the governor. And the reasons were, you know, we this is too big. It's too broad. We don't know if uh, if these facilities, we don't know where they will be or who will be involved. And uh, and the tribes were thinking, you know, IGRA it, it, you know, there's more regulations and more restrictions in federal law. So that so these concerns about, you know, are there are the laws going to be followed? Are these going to be run properly? There's really no need for those concerns um, under the way that the law at, or the bill and the recommendation were set up. So, you know, now we we have been talking with the governor's office, our tribal attorneys and leaders in this time. And gaming is, is something we're talking about. Uh, you know, to see if we can ever find some compromise on this this issue. But the tribes are pretty firm that should we advance any efforts in gaming, uh, this should be a, a symbol of sovereignty and not something that's dictated by the state of Maine. It should look like 554 looked like. Yeah, right. What can people listening to this um, show do to help? You know, something that that we really have going for us is that this bill is sponsored by Assistant Majority Leader Rachel Talbot Ross, who is just fierce and dedicated. And and we really um, couldn't ask for a better advocate in this fight uh, with her position and and her prowess in in government and and her experience as a woman of color in Maine. You know, we also co-chair the Permanent Commission on uh, Racial, Indigenous and Tribal Populations. So we work closely there. And and I'm really thankful for that relationship that she has with the tribes. And I think it helps us a lot here. You know, if you look at 1626, it's basically the tribes want sovereignty restored and recognized. And all that means is we want jurisdiction and, you know, ownership or or feeling connected to our lands, our natural resources and our people. And and it really won't affect the everyday Mainer, but it'll really help tribes. And and I think the effects on everyday Mainers will only be positive when you're looking at economic development or, um, you know, are having these jurisdictional boundaries much clearer. I think it'll cut down a lot of confusion. So I would urge people to take an actual look at the law and uh, or the bill and to read through some of the, the testimony from, from the last public hearing, I, I think you'll find there there's a lot more reasons for kind of hope and healing than a lot of the fear that's thrown around about it. Well, hopefully it will bring that hope and healing that is so long overdue. And uh, maybe the fact that it's an election year um, will help. <laughs> we hope that that might help move people along. Uh, so thank you so much for your work and um Hopefully everyone's listening and we can be the best kind of allies and people can call our representatives, they can call their legislators, they can call the governor's office. Um, And I know that as the session goes on, uh, you'll keep us abreast of what is happening when and what we need to do when. So um, thank you again for your leadership and um, let's hope that after 40 years, we can actually fix this. Absolutely. And I should mention uh, WabanakiAlliance.com is our group of, you know, our intertribal coalition. And we're, we have, um, you know, we've updated that website with help from our coalition partners. And that's a great resource for folks, too. Yeah, there's great talking points on there. There's great what to do. I was looking at it last night. So it's, it's, a, it's a really wonderful resource. So thank you, Molly Ann. Here's to uh, healing and progress. And um, hopefully this will be the year. I am very pleased to welcome back to the main challenge, Representative Charlotte Warren chair of the Criminal Justice Committee and also my personal representative. Um, Charlotte, thanks so much for being with us on Main Challenge again. I know that as chair of criminal justice, um, you have been involved in a lot of issues that I think are gonna come up to the fore um, this session, um, including issues on corrections and in our prisons and jails and mental health and substance use disorder. So tell us as you look forward, what's looking, what's, what do you see on the plate? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, There is, as always, a lot on the plate. So I'm just going to focus on three specific bills that um, I think that people can engage with and I hope that they will engage with. Um, And the first one is an expansion of our Good Samaritan law in Maine. A Good Samaritan law says that if you are with someone that's overdosing and you make a call to save their life, 
you should not face criminal consequences. Mm -hmm. People are probably sick of hearing me say it, but I'm going to continue to say it. It's now 13 people a week in Maine are dying a completely preventable death mm -hmm. um, from overdoses. We have a bill that would expand protections under the Good Samaritan um, law to anyone that is in that location. They are protected. Police, when they show up, if they show up along with rescue, should stay in their car yeah. because this is a medical issue and we need to save lives. So that's the Good Samaritan bill. It's sponsored by our good friend, Senator Chloe Maxman. Awesome. Um, secondly, I want to tell you about a bill that is very important um, for the inside of our incarcerated um, facilities, both county jails and the state prison system. And this is a bill that would regulate the cost of phone calls. And one of the best ways that we do corrections is to connect people with their children, to connect people with their loved ones, with their work, with their partners, with their community, with their priest, with their therapist, with their lawyer, etc. And the cost of phone calls um, is unbelievable. And so that families, first of all, all of us in our taxes pay for the correctional facilities to run. So if you are someone who has somebody incarcerated and you want to make a phone call to them, you're in fact being taxed twice, yes, right? Yeah. And we know what the data says. It says that um, in fact, it is the poorest of Mainers who are incarcerated. It is the poorest of Mainers who are the families that are supporting incarcerated loved ones. So um, that is a very important bill. Um, that's LD 1175. Um, and that's a bill in the Criminal Justice Committee. And the third bill I want to talk to you about just quickly is a bill that's actually in the Health and Human Services Committee. And it's a bill that we carried over from last year. Um, and it's my bill. Um, and it is a bill that creates a dedicated account for when we receive, when Maine, the state of Maine, receives the opioid settlement funds. And we're prepared to receive millions and millions and millions of dollars. And what my bill, 1722, LD 1722 does, is it creates a protected fund within the attorney general's office so that we can put some guardrails around that money. So like the tobacco settlement fund. Yeah, yes. Fund for Healthy Maine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. No, that's awesome. exactly the example that we have used as we've written this bill. Um, so, so that's a, another really important proposal. So awesome. I'm happy to answer questions, but those are the three I was thinking about for today. No, that's awesome. Okay, so this is our year to do the right thing. And I know that you are going to be an awesome, uh, fierce leader on all of these issues. And we are so grateful. And I'm sure that during the session, we'll circle back to you to get more information about what's happening. And um, we appreciate your leadership and your vision. And thank you so much for being with us on Main Challenge. Thank you, Betsy. We appreciate your leadership and your vision. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. That's so great to have you. Thanks. So it's the start of a new legislative session. And what I want to say is get involved right here in Maine. It's so important. And in Maine, it's so easy. We really do have a citizen legislature. And I know people talk about that and think about that, but we really do. I remember when I started 40 years ago, I had come from working in Washington at the Capitol. And I walked into the state house and I said, well, where are their offices? Where are the legislators' offices? And where are their staff people? And where you know, and it was like, uh, we don't have offices and committees have staff, but individual members don't have staff. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then the people were just walking around and you could go up and actually talk to the actual legislator. Um, and then the thing that really blew my mind was they said, I said, well, you know, how do you get in touch with them if you're not talking to their staff people? And they said, oh, there's this book. There's a book right here. So Maine publishes a book 
that has every legislator's phone number, often cell phone numbers, uh, personal emails, what they do, who their family is. I mean, it's amazing. So it, like, I was like, what? You're giving us their home phone numbers? So it is really, really easy to be involved. It is easy to make that call. It is easy to follow them on social media. So there is a lot coming up this year from all the things we talked about, um, criminal justice reform, the budget, what's gonna happen with the budget. It's an election year, you know, um, climate change. There's so much going on. And I know that there's something that you care a lot about that's going on. So be sure to just make that call. Don't be worried about, you don't have all the information. Don't worry that it's gonna be too hard. The legislators want to hear from you. And by and large, they are so respectful and so nice. And with all the committee meetings now being done virtually by Zoom, one small benefit from COVID, you don't have to come to Augusta to testify on a hearing. So if you ever need help on testifying or have an idea, be in touch with me. Go to our info at Main Challenge and ask me a question. You can ask me um, anything about how to get involved. But the most important thing is we need to do it. It's an election year. Our democracy is at stake. And the best way for us to save it is for us to be involved. So just do it.